Okay, welcome back to the Classics and Immunology Journal Club. Uh, before we get started, I want you to uh, like the video if you liked it, and then click on the uh, subscribe to the to the channel. Got all kinds of things on there that you might want to know about. Yeah. Click on the bell to get notified for new videos, and then also scroll down and check out my website because I've, we've got all of the classics and immunology papers <clears throat> just there, right at your fingertips. So today um, we're we, we're going to be in 1985 to a paper about interleukin one, and so since it's about interleukins, it's one of one of my uh, papers that's dear to my heart. And the authors of this are Philip Oron. Andrew Webb, Lanny Rosenwasser, Steve, Stephen Mucci, Alex Rich, Sheldon Wolf, and Charles Dinarello. Charles be, being the senior author. Uh, Philip Warren, the first author, is a molecular biologist from MIT. And Charles um, uh, was at Tufts University in Boston Medical School. And Alex Riches was a very famous molecular biologist who was in the same department with Philip Warren at MIT. Sheldon Wolf was one of Charles' mentors and really was responsible for him getting involved in, in this area of research or continuing this area of research. It was published in the uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in December of 1984. And these dates, as you'll see as we go on, become extremely important in terms of priority, which all the scientists are concerned about. Now, the background on this paper is that Charles, when he was a, um, a house officer, he was a clinical type like me, and he became interested in fever. He started uh, researching it, uh, even as a as a um, intern and resident. Ultimately, found himself at the NIH um, uh, working on it. I think with Sheldon Wolf at the time, uh, and trying to find out what was going on in this whole thing. And fever at the time, uh, there was a bioassay, an in vivo bioassay in the rabbit. And if you had something that you thought would cause fever, you could just squirt it into the rabbit and the rabbit's ears would sort of droop down and, and you could, that was an indication that the poor rabbit felt terrible. Um, then you could also um, measure the rabbit's temperature with an erectile probe and get very accurate readings. And you could, you could show then that there was a fever curve that uh, went up and then came back down again after the injection of whatever it was. Um, and at the time, it had been shown that uh, if, you could, if you stimulated leukocytes, which meant all of the white blood cells, the, the polymorphal nuclear leukocytes or the microphages as Metchnikoff called them back in the 19th century, and then the monocyte macrophages, uh, and then the lymphocytes. Um, and so it wasn't clear which one of these leukocytes, or maybe all of them, were making whatever. But if you activated those cells, the, the, these cells in vitro with lipopolysaccharide, and then waited a while and then take, took the, the fluid off of the cells, spun the cells out in the centrifuge and then took the fluid, squirted it into the rabbit, then you could show that it would cause fever. And that was called endogenous pyrogen. So that was the beginning of this whole thing. And, and I actually visited Charlie when he was, um, Charles, when he was um, at Tufts before this paper was published. He took me into his cold room and he showed me this huge um, um, column that was like from floor to ceiling and this big around. And it was filled up with cephidex, which is, are these little beads um, that would separate molecules on the, on the basis of their molecular sizes. But I'd never seen a column this big. I mean, usually they were, you know, this tall, about 12 inches tall and about maximum of an inch or around, an inch in diameter. So, <laughs> and he was describing to me all of his experiments where he was making these supernatants from mono mononuclear cells and loading them onto this column and then drip, having it drip out the other end and, and then assaying them in the rabbit uh, in vivo bioassay to see where the activity was. Well, he pursued, pursued this for quite some time. And, and as time went on, the field became more and more more and more people got involved in trying to understand what, what the macrophages were doing in the immune response as opposed to the lymphocytes. And by this time in, this, in the 70s, late 70s, and then early 80s, this is when things started to really heat up. So in the introduction of this paper, they, um, they mentioned these, these, not only endogenous pyrogen, but other, other 
factors or activities that have been found to be thought to be due to macrophages. The, the primary one was lymphocyte activating factor or LAF. Um, there were two papers that came out in the Journal of Experimental Medicine in 1972 from Yale, from uh, Byron Waxman's group with Egal Gary was the, was the first author, young guy, uh, postdoc from Israel who did done all the work. And these, these were really classic papers, 1972. We reviewed them here in the, in the journal club. So if you want to, you can go back uh, and, and check out uh, those papers. So that was, and they coined the term LAF, lymphocyte act activating factor. And when Charlie was running through his um, separative biochemical separative procedures, um, he, he found that, that whatever was endogenous pyrogen and laugh co-purified. Um, and um, so that, you know, so the question was, how many molecules are there responsible for these different activities? Another activity was called um, uh, leukocyte endogenous um, mediator, which uh, when uh, injected into animals would cause the so-called acute phase proteins, primarily manufactured by the liver, would go sky high. And acute phase proteins were one of the clinical um, manifestations that was measured in clinical laboratories uh, for when you had a real serious inflammatory response going on. Uh, ultimately, the that particular activity had been, was ultimately in the future uh, narrowed down to be interleukin six, uh, which was both a macrophage product as well as a lymphocyte T cell product. Anyway, the laugh and the and the pyrogen co purified, and so the question became: um, Is there one or several molecules that are responsible for all of this? And so, Charlie uh, Charles. You know, he did the yoma, he did the college try to, to try to purify this. But what we all didn't know, I think, and us included, um, was exactly how potent these biological activities really were. And what we found ultimately, um, when we developed the radio labeled interleukin 2 binding assay, we found that these things were really potent. They were, they had a, <clears throat> Um, affinity constant of 10 to the minus 11th molar. And just to give you, I think I've said this before, a means of comparison, most antibody had um, affinity constants in the order of uh, 10 to the minus six to 10 to the minus ninth. So 10 to the minus 11th was, was really a high affinity uh, kind of a binding site, which meant that you could measure the biological activity if you had a bioassay but you didn't have much protein there. So if you're trying to purify protein, you've got to start with huge, huge amounts of starting material. And we didn't really have a clue that that's what you needed to do. And I don't think Charlie did either. We were starting with hundred mLs trying to purify that. Well, ultimately we needed 10, 10 or more liters. And so, <laughs> so you know, <laughs> you're, we were just uh, spinning our wheels, as one of my mentors used to tell me. Smith, you're spinning your wheels. And, uh, so in the materials and methods of this paper, there were several different things that they go into. They, first of all, was the preparation. So the, what they decided to do, since they couldn't purify the protein, was to try to clone the gene using the biological activity of the interleukin-1 or the, uh, the pyrogen laugh molecule. And, and Charlie had been, Charles had been um, successful of purifying enough of the activity uh, to squirt it into rabbits and make a rabbit antibody, anti-serum serum that would um, inhibit the, um, the pyrogen activity and or the laugh activity as an in vitro assay. So he had that. So they had the biological activity and they had an antibody that would block that. And that was what they started with. And they decided with that, they ought to be able to clone the gene. And of course, this was, this, you have to remember that the, in gene cloning had only come into being since, 19, since the mid seventies. And so this is, 
you know, this is like nine, uh, five years later, and, and you had to be, a, you had to be, or you had to get to collect, collaborate with a gene jockey to be able to do these kinds of experiments because they were, you know, they were not trivial. So the first one was the preparation of messenger RNA from monocytes macrophages that had been stimulated with lipopolysaccharide. And Charlie, Charles, I don't know why I keep calling him Charlie, Charlie, because I always called him Charles. Anyway, Charles, he focused on, because he was a physician and so forth and so on, he focused on human um, monocyte macrophages that he could get from the peripheral blood uh, of humans. Um, and most of the immunological um, card, card carrying immunologists were working in the mouse. Uh, that, when you're trying to make a antibodies and you're injecting mouse products into mice, um, you can't take advantage of the genetic disparity between species as much. So by focusing on humans, he made his life easier. Now he didn't make a monoclonal antibody. Um, uh, he was used to using rabbits because of the B in vivo bioassay for endogenous pyrogen. And he probably had a lot of rabbits around and so he made a rabbit antisera. Uh, and the only problem with that is, is that you have to be very careful about um, injecting the rabbits with as purified um, product as you possibly have, because you don't want to have a bunch of um, antibodies in that serum that were reactive with a bunch of other things. You want it to be very specific for, the, for whatever your, your antigen is. So in order to make the messenger RNA from stimulated LPS stimulated uh, monocytes, um, he, would, um, he would take uh, peripheral blood, purify the mononuclear cells you can, using these, um, these density gradients so that you could, you could select out for the monocytes and the lymphocytes it incubate those um, cells on plastic flasks or glass uh, flasks for 30 minutes at 37 degrees, and the monocytes would would settle down on the bottom of the flask and spread out like fried eggs and attach. And then after that, you could just you could rinse off the lymphocytes, the non-adherent cells, um, and you could throw them away or use them for other kinds of things. Um, then you could add LPS to those flasks, and which he did, and he incubated them overnight then at 37 degrees at, at body temperature. And then the next day would lice the, the cells, threw away the supernatant, <coughs> harvested the cells, <coughs> and lysed the cells in six molar guanidine hydrochloride, which would allow the extraction and not only lice the cells, but it allowed the extraction of the RNA. That was a routine method to, uh, to do that. <clears throat> then, so that was total RNA from the cells that he had there. And what you really wanted to do would get the messenger RNA. Now the messenger RNA in, in most cells was a, was a small fraction of the total, anywhere from five to 10% of the total RNA uh, because a lot of the RNA in cells was the ribosomal variety because they were in the process of uh, making proteins from the ribosomal RNA. So it turns out that the molecular biotypes had figured out that uh, the messenger RNA had, at the tail end of the, of the RNA sequence, they had a poly A sequence, A, 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 A. And so the corresponding nucleotide that would pair with A was T. And so they made oligo DT columns, um, binding them to sephiros and having a little, you know, little columns or that sort of thing. So you, so you could take your lysate that contained all of the RNA and run it through the column and the poly A RNA would stick. And then you could then, and get rid, you could wash and get rid of the rest of it. And then you could, you could concentrate your, uh, your messenger RNA. So that's what they did. Um, and so they purified that from stimulated, LPS stimulated cells, and then from, uh, from non-stimulated cells. Um, and, they, and then they found out that when they, well, when all was said and done that their, their poly A RNA was only 5% of the total.
So that was their RNA source. And then for what they wanted to do was to see if they could, from that RNA, put it into systems. And then those, these also existed at the time from the, uh, from the gene jockey people um, who had worked out ways to, to translate messenger RNA into protein. And then if you had an assay for protein, and of course, that's what Char Charles had. He, had. he had the bioassay and he had the antibody that would react with the protein. So um, what, what they did was that there was a system called the reticulocyte, um, reticulocyte lysate assay. So this is, not to get into the weeds too far, reticulocytes had, had um, the machinery to be able to um, translate um, RNA into protein. So, and it was a pretty, you could buy these at the store at that time in little kits. And you could, you could take the reticulocyte lysate and uh, add your uh, poly A uh, RNA and, and incubate for an hour or so at 37 degrees. And then you oh. could um, immunoprecipitate that the protein, if there was any, the, uh, oh, I forgot to say, you, you did this in the presence of S35 uh, labeled methionine as one amino acid. And so any newly translated proteins would become radio, radioactive. And you could then precipitate that with, uh, with the, anti, the rabbit anti-serum. You could take that precipitate and analyze it for, for protein size on SDS polyacrylamide gels that will separate the cells just like gel filtration, except they would they would run down according to their molecular weights. So, so that's, they did that. And then what you could do is because the, whatever was brought down by their antibody should be radio labeled. Um, you could then um, expose the, your gel to, um, um, to do an auto radiograph, uh, fluorograph in this instance, uh, and, and find out where the molecular, you have molecular weight markers and you figure out what's going on. And then you could also, because this is the other way they could detect their pro their protein, was is that they could test for biological activity using the I forgot to yeah no okay using the IL the IL one assay and I think I forgot to tell you about what that was. Hold on a second. Yeah, that's that's coming next. In order to translate enough protein so that you could measure it in the bioassay, though. They, uh, the other, the gene jockeys had also figured out that if you took frog um, eggs, frog eggs from Xenopus um, uh, strain of, um, of frogs, and so these were macroscopic, you could see these things with the naked eye, which meant that you could inject them um, with a very tiny needle, uh, your messenger RNA preparation, and um, and then incubate them overnight, actually, at, at room temperature in this instance, because, you know, amphibians, they don't need to be at 37 degrees. And so, and so what you did is you, you, take the, you took these things and they would then, they would translate the poly A RNA and, and release the protein in, into the surrounding milieu. And then you could test that for um, bioactivity. And now the bioactivity that they use is sort of, I really like their bioassay. The, the one that was originated by um, Egal Gary and Byron Waxman in 1972 was using thymocytes. And they would use thymocytes at a very high density and active and add um, sub mitogenic doses of PHA to the cultures. And then they would add their macrophage supernatants to see if there, there was any bioactivity in the in the laugh preparations. Dinarello um, had worked out that that he could use uh, clone T cell, IL2 dependent clone T cell lines instead of the thymocytes. And that was a much better assay. And you could use specific antigen as your um, stimulus for the T cell receptor, but then you could add um, uh, laugh to it or endogenous pyrogen and it would cause a marked augmentation of the proliferation of those cells. They would then make IL-2 and then they would proliferate and this was a very good assay. And then finally, the, the, um, once they identified what they, what they thought was the, was the IL-1 messenger RNA, then they, they used that 
to clone cDNA. And they, they would then use, use the messenger RNA, RNA to make um, CDNA, cDNA radio labeled copies that they could screen cDNA libraries with. And they, they started with three CDNA, cDNA libraries from LPS stimulated macrophages um, made with the RNA from those, from those cells. Uh, and they came up with three um, cDNA probes from stimulated and unstimulated poly A RNA. And that's what they, they use then to do differential screening of their, of their libraries. So in the results, which, which will require us to look at um, their paper. So this is the, this is the data from the, the uh, <clears throat> fluorograph of the reticulocyte lysate uh, translation of, of poly A RNA. What, what you should focus on uh, are, is to compare lane three with lane five. So what they came out with, with at least, you know, they, <laughs> I'm not doing this right, with um, say three proteins here, two that were very heavy, a very um, slight protein here at 26. These are the molecular weight markers. Um, so it was 42, 35, 26. If you compare lane three with lane five, this was a, a translation product that they keyed in on. And they, they, they keyed in on this particular protein at 35 kilodaltons because this lane here in lane five, they had added um, uh, cold, not radio labeled, uh, IL-1 in, in, in excess. And that competed for this particular protein. So that told them that they were on, a, on this track according to what, what they th thought they might be the, their, um, their molecule. So they did the same kind of an experiment of reticulocyte lysate protein uh, translation, but this time they used their, uh, their, um, their RNA to, to see if they could um, select for uh, translation products uh, from the RNA that they were able to, um, to select. And they found that they got a, a series, these, these are lanes four, five, and six, four through nine actually contain all the same one. And number six was the very best. Um, and they used, used number six then to make um, cDNA um, from the RNA to make cDNA probes. So then if they, they go in on and, and they, here is the biological activity of the hybrid selected RNA. And you can see that there is a nice peak of, of uh, bioactivity, IL-1 activity in terms of units per ml, but that was using the T cell, T cell clone as a readout on that whole thing. So then they, they took that and they went to their li cDNA libraries and they went fishing to see if they could find um, uh, a cDNA that would um, code for a molecule that might be um, interleukin-1. And to make a long story very short, they came up with this is about 1500 base pairs. So here it's the beginning here and here way down here is the poly A tail. Um, and you, you can see that you, the, the translation from here is a nice long open reading frame that actually uh, had contained 269 amino acids. And that calculates out then uh, to be a, a protein with a molecular size of about 30,000 uh, Daltons. Uh, and that was bigger than what they had originally thought about because they knew that most of the IL-1 um, that they had um, been trying to purify was around 15,000 Dalton. So it was about half the size of this, uh, of this whole thing. Um, but be that as it may, they, they went on to the discussion then, made the following points that their criteria for the identif identification of the IL-1 IL IL-1 cDNA was the bioassay 
on the one hand and the immunoprecipitation with the anti-sera on the other hand. And, and that, was, that was where they were starting from. And, but they also used this differential screening kind of thing and they found no bioactivity from unstimulated, their unstimulated controls. And so that was good, that was what you want. The thing about the sequence that, that I just showed you was is that normally a secreted protein would start out with a very hydrophobic um, string of amino acids of about anywhere from 10 to 20 to 30. Um, the, and they, this had been previously shown that in proteins that were secreted to the outside had this signal sequence. And this protein didn't have a signal sequence. And that was sort of a problem. And uh, so if, but then they go on to say that they, they noticed they had some other stimuli that they were using in the lab to, to make the IL-1 activity. And they found that some, some of the stimuli that were actually very toxic to the cells, they got even more IL-1 activity out. And so they, they thought to themselves, well, you know, maybe this isn't a secreted protein normally. It, it's only released um, by monocyte macrophages when they become damaged. And so then they leak their intracellular constituents to the outside. Um, and actually that subsequently was proven to be the case. And I was very skeptical back then. Scientists, scientists are supposed to be skeptical. And so I, I looked at those data and I said, I'm not sure. But of course, Interleukin-1 is one of the, it turned out subsequently, and you know, we go into that phase of this, of this um, journal club, interleukin-1 is one of the major pro-inflammatory cytokines, along with interleukin-6 and TNF. That triumvirate um, are present in bacterial sepsis and in, in um, the so-called cytokine storm that happens in, um, in, in using CAR T cells to, to, for the treatment of cancer. And, and if you use very high doses of interleukin-2 to treat cancer patients the way Steven Rosenberg did, you get, get all the same syndrome. It's a septic shock kind of thing. And the major players in, that, in producing that septic shock are IL-1, IL-6, and TNF. Now there's a story that goes along. Subsequently, so that was it, and that was the paper. And that was published in December of um, 1985 in PNAS. Now it turns out, what happened in this whole story, and I've spoken to Charles because he's a good friend, and we've stayed connected over the years, and I'll get into some of the things that he helped me with. Uh, this fellow, Oren, uh, submitted the, the manuscript in Nature originally in 1983. Then by the end of 1983, they had this, and they submitted it to Nature, and Nature took forever to review it. And finally, finally sent it back to them uh, that they didn't accept it. And then what, what happened was Alex Rich, who was a very uh, prestigious molecular biologist, um, contacted Nature and said, you know, can you send this out for um, more review? So they did. Now, who did they send it to? And um, they sent that paper to Steve Gillis, who was my very first graduate student who had left my lab by this time, he left it back in 1979. He was only there a couple of three years. And um, he went to Seattle and uh, to, to started on the, as a postdoc with Chris Henney. And then he, he uh, and Chris Henney left the university and started a biotech company. And it turns out that they had decided that they needed to, to clone the cDNA for interleukin-1 and they were working on this. There is a paper or, or a, a sort of a news and view kind of um, article that, or report that came out in Science. And I'll just give you the, the um, reference for that. It's uh, volume 270, page 1912. That was uh, published in, Dece in December 22nd, uh, 1995. And this is where this information comes from. You should, if you're interested, you can come back and read it. It's all the, all the uh, gossip that surrounds this paper. So Gillis got the paper to review in, in July of 19, uh, 1984. And he wrote back basically saying that they were also trying to 
identify the cDNA. And they had thought they had identified something that they that didn't look like this guy, this particular thing. And so, and he said, and he didn't recommend acceptance or rejection. He just said, you know, I don't, I don't know if this is really true or not, essentially. Um, and he sent that back. And so ultimately nature rejected this paper. And that's why it appeared in PNAS. And it was submitted in August of um, uh, uh, 85 and appeared in December. Turns out there was a meeting in, in, um, in Germany at a, at a castle, Schloss Elmo in October, at, at which time, um, uh, Oren was giving a presentation and basically talking about the data that they had had. Um, and he flashed a sequence onto the screen. And I was there at this particular meeting. It was only on there for like a, an instant, essentially, <laughs> a second. And suddenly from the audience, Chris Henney got up and strode up to the, to the dais and, and took the microphone and said that, this, I think he said that he was aware of these data and this was not interleukin one. And then he went back and sat down. And of course that, that created a big brouhaha at this meeting. It was the signature meeting for when the IL-1 story became a brouhaha. Um, ultimately, um, what happened was is that Gillis and Henny, uh, they, had, they had something else that shared a, a very, um, just a barely, uh, a bare sequence homology to, to the uh, IL-1 cDNA that, that um, from the Dinarello group. Um, and so it, what they did was is that they, they published a paper or they, they submitted a paper to Nature um, that ultimately was accepted and appeared uh, the next year um, in, um, in Nature. Actually, I'm not, I, think I'm, I think I'm a little bit confused here because that was 1984 when this paper came out. Yeah, this paper was December 1984. Well, about June or so of 1985, there was a paper came out in Nature from Gillis and Henney's um, biotech company saying that there were two different IL-1 um, genes uh, and they had this cloned the cDNA for both of them. And, um, and they named their, their particular sequence interleukin 1 alpha and called Generella sequence interleukin 1 beta. Subsequently, there, it turns out that in the initial sequence that, that uh, Generella's group had um, submitted in their original paper to Nature, there were seven nucleotide um, mistakes. And they've realized this subsequently, they went back and repeated their sequences and determinations and so forth. And then they corrected the sequence. And that was, the, you know, it was the sequence, except for one amino acid, um, the nucleotide changes were in the, either in the um, five prime or the three prime untranslated region. So it didn't make any difference really. Well, then in the early 90s, and that's why this paper in science came out in, uh, or, or report in science came out in 95, um, the patents, the respective patents for, from the Ginarella group and from the Gillis Henney group uh, were published. And they, both, they were both given patents. They were both finally uh, issued and published. And um, then the Ginarella's group saw that the initial seven nucleotide changes or mistakes that they had had in their original paper. And, and Gillis and Henny had just copied them and submitted them uh, for a patent application. So that's the, um, the wild, wild west of, of biotechnology that occurred after the publication or after the um, Bayh-Dole Act of 1980 when you could patent things. So I'll stop there. Don't forget to like the Journal Club videos if, if you do, and click on the bell, subscribe to the channel.
check out my website and also my social social media site because I have lots of things to say, primarily in the last couple of years about COVID. So thanks for coming and we'll see you next time.